I, it won't be on the exam, but just take a look at some of these other wonderful defenses that your body has that can protect you non-specifically. It's really amazing. It's, it, it's amazing how much your body does to protect you against these pathogens. So let us first start with the inflammatory response. And we'll just look at, we'll just read these effects, and then we're going to flip to the cartoon that's on page. We're going to flip to the cartoon that would be on your page. I think it's page five. That's what we're going to end up with. But let's just first take a look at what inflammation accomplishes. So we're going to increase blood flow to the area where microbial invasion has occurred. We're going to activate our phagocytes, our professional killing cells. Um, we're, we're going to see some of those same changes we saw with endotoxic shock, which is kind of an exaggerated inflammatory response. We're going to get an increase in capillary permeability. We're going to see vasodilation. We're going to have these wonderful complement proteins activated. Um, there will be clotting uh, to try to wall off the invading pathogens. Um, we'll have an increase in temperature, which can inhibit the growth of, of some microbes and helps um, increase the killing efficiency of our phagocytes and also helps with binding of antimicrobial compounds to invade pathogens. And then we'll have activation of our specific acquired defenses. Okay, so um, on the exam, what I'll have probably is a blank out cartoon of inflammation. Those of you that have accessed the little kind of practice quiz on D2L, um, one of the questions is, you know, to label the steps in the cartoon. You're probably going, what cartoon? This is the cartoon on the practice quiz. So just so you all know, um, this cartoon <coughs> has shown up on exam before. And what I do is I white out, I white out all the captions, and then I have a number of steps that are in you know, mixed up order, and I have to match the description of uh, the step to each of these steps here. Just so, so I guess what I'm telling you is you might see this cartoon on the exam. I guess that's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, so let's look at the steps of inflammation, and we'll just start just really simply by saying inflammation is our body's response. Hmm, which arm should I use? Use that one yesterday. Okay, inflammation is our body's response to tissue damage. And it could be physical damage, just like I'm just um, scratching my, my um, arm right now with my skin. I'm causing physical damage to my cells, and that will trigger an inflammatory response. In addition, you know, with microbial invasion, microbial invasion will trigger an inflammatory response. So we want to take a look at what are the classic signs. So um, it might be hard to see here, but I can see it's starting to get red. Um, somebody who's very sensitive might be able to feel that, oh, it's starting to get a little bit warmer than the surrounding area. Um, pretty soon we might be able to see some swelling, right? And I can tell you already it's starting to hurt. You know, whenever I do this, I'm like, don't go overboard on it, right? Okay, so these are the classic signs of inflammation. The redness, the heat, um, swelling, and pain. So we want to try to understand what is going on you know, what's going on in my tissues that causes those signs? And why are these changes helpful? How are they, you know, how are they protective? Okay, so that's, that's where we'll turn to our cartoon here. Okay, so this is kind of the classic cartoon for inflammation. In this example, we have a wooden splinter that's contaminated with bacteria that's pierced the skin and introduced these bacteria into the, the deeper tissues, right? So hence, interior nonspecific defenses. As a result of the tissue damage and as a result of some of the um, microbial products, our cells will release chemical messengers, and we're just going to call these chemical messengers inflammatory mediators. Probably the most famous inflammatory mediator is histamine. Okay. Now, in response to these inflammatory mediators, we're going to see changes in our blood vessels. And one of the changes will be vasodilation, where the diameter of the blood vessels will get larger. That's what's going to increase blood flow to that area of damage. That's what's causing the redness on my skin right now is vasodilation. And with increased blood flow, we'll have an increase in temperature. So the vasodilation is also responsible for the heat we associate with inflammation. Now, in addition to vasodilation, the cells that make up the walls of our vessels, these are called endothelial cells. In response to those inflammatory mediators, they're going to shrink or retract. And as a consequence, we're going to open up 
up some gaps between the endothelial cells. This will permit fluid from the blood to pass through those gaps and into the extravascular uh, tissues where those invading microbes are located. So this is going to help with the delivery of antimicrobial substances such as complement, uh, antibodies, if antibodies are present, uh, fibrinogen, which will be converted to fibrin to help fall off these invading pathogens. And in addition, those little gaps are going to permit our white blood cells, and I'm thinking specifically right now of our first responders, our neutrophils, our professional hydrocytic cells. Those gaps will help the neutrophils squeeze through the gaps, leave the bloodstream, then migrate into the tissues where the microbes have invaded. Now, <clears throat> this process described here is emigration of leukocytes. This is a very cool process. So we might wonder how is it that the leukocytes know, uh, and, and we'll use the neutrophils right now, how do the neutrophils know uh, in which, which spot of the vessel they should leave? All right, so it's so cool, you guys. Those inflammatory mediators, they trigger the endothelial cells to express new surface molecules, surface receptors. And our, our neutrophils and macrophages have complementary molecules on their surface. So what they first do is they bind to the surface of the endothelial cells that have been activated or expressing these new molecules. This binding um, appears to us, if you're watching it through a microscope, it looks like the neutrophils are lining up along the margins of the blood vessels. And so this process is called margination. margination. And then what we notice is the neutrophils are squeezing between those gaps. And that process is called diapodine where they're actually moving from the lumen of the blood vessel into the extravascular tissues. Now, we can see here that they are migrating to ground zero, where the bacteria have invaded. And we might ask, how do they know where to go? What's guiding their movement? So what the phagocytes use is the concentration gradient of those chemical messengers, of the inflammatory mediators, and they can also use a concentration gradient of microbial products being produced. So that process is called what? When we use a concentration gradient of chemicals to guide movement? Chemotaxis. It's called chemotaxis. Spot on, you guys. So the phagocytic cells use chemotaxis to guide them to ground zero, right where the pathogens have invaded. And, and of course, their job is to attach to the invading pathogens ingest them in this process of phagocytosis and hopefully kill them quickly. So right now, you guys, I have neutrophils patrolling. You know, check it out and see, are there any foreign microbes that have been introduced? And if they encounter one of those microbes, they would use their surface receptors to attach to the invading microbes, ingest them through phagocytosis and destroy them, right? And that's the beauty, you guys. If our phagocytes can respond quickly enough even though we might have bacteria introduced into our tissues, these phagocytes, if they're fast enough, they might be able to kill the small numbers of invading bacteria before they have a chance to start multiplying, dividing, spreading. Yeah, so that, that's just absolutely lovely, that inflammation. Okay, so the last topic, you guys, for nonspecific defenses is we're just going to look at the steps of phagocytosis. And probably for a lot of you, it's going to be kind of a review from lab. But we'll just we'll just walk through it here. Okay. And on your um, handout, I kind of went eight, you guys, on phagocytosis. They they learn <laughs> so much about phagocytosis and how phagocytes interact with microbes. So I went a little bit goofy here, but we'll just try to hit the, the main uh, the main event. And again, um, I tried to insert the overhead we're going to use for this, you guys. So it's the uh, overhead will use is one of the inserts here. <coughs> okay, so we're looking at those phagocytes that are arriving on the scene of invasion, and we're asking ourselves well, just exactly what are they going to do. So, this incredible process of phagocytosis. Um, well, got a seasick phagocytosis. Okay, so this could be, um, this could be a macrophage or a neutrophil our professional phagocytic cells. So remember, the phagocytes follow the concentration gradient of inflammatory mediators and or microbial products to find ground zero where the pathogens have invaded. 
Now, big advances have been made in understanding how the phagocytes attach to the microbes. And, <coughs> and not, you guys are, don't panic, because I'm not going to ask for this detail, but in the upper left-hand corner is a diagram of a phagocyte um, showing some of the receptors that phagocytes have on their surface. Now, for a phagocyte to be able to attach to an innovative microbe, um, the phagocytes have to be able to use their receptors to bind to the surface of the invading phagocyte. And if they don't have a receptor, if, they, if the phagocytes don't have a receptor that can bind to the surface of the pathogen, they can't, they can't attach to them, they can't kill them. And that's the beauty of capsules, uh, for the invading microbes. Um, most capsules are made out of polysaccharides, and most of our phagocytes don't have surface receptors that can bind to those polysaccharides of capsules, and that's why the capsules are anti-phagocytic. The capsule literally makes the main microbes slippery. The phagocyte tries to attach to them, and they just slide right away from them. Okay, so that's that's a, 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 an important virulence factor for a lot of invading bacteria. Okay, now we'll just presume that this phagocyte has receptors that can attach to the surface of the phagocyte. Here we see these cytoplasmic <coughs> extensions, these pseudopods, which are going to reach out and circle the invading pathogens once um, um, the phagocyte has attached to them. And we can see here that the pseudopods will merge and form a membrane-bound vesicle called an endosome, or in this case, since um, we're ingesting an actual cell, this would be called a phagosome, literally an eating body. This is so cool, you guys. When the phagosome is formed, there are little proton pumps that are activated in the membrane of the phagosome, and these proton pumps pump in hydrogen ions, protons from the cytoplasm into the interior of the phagosome to acidify it. And this has a very <coughs> function in the next step. We see in this next step that these, uh, a, a second membrane-bound vesicle called the lysosome fuses with the phagosome. So here you have fusion of the lysosome with the phagosome. And it's like German, we just keep adding words together. This forms a phagolysosome, and this is where the killing occurs. The lysosome has delivered hydrolytic digestive enzymes to the phagosome. And these hydrolytic digestive enzymes include proteases to destroy proteins, lipases to destroy lipids, nucleases to destroy nucleic acids, etc. Now, these hydrolytic enzymes only become active under low pH. And that is why we had to acidify that phagosome first. We have to have a low pH inside the phagolysosome before those hydrolytic enzymes are activated. Now, isn't that the coolest thing? So hopefully those hydrolytic enzymes could destroy the invading pathogen, right? But another theme in our immune system is we often have like backup systems. If one system fails, we have a backup system. And we see that with phagocytosis, that if for whatever reason those hydrolytic enzymes don't destroy the pathogen, there's a backup system. In the membrane of the phagolysosome are enzymes that are going to start generating those reactive oxygen intermediates. And I'm going to flip up the lights, you guys. I hope this is a blind thing to move back and forth. Do you remember from chapter <coughs> six, microbial growth? What were those roids, those toxic roids? Do you remember what those were? Great review for the final. <laughs> Superoxide anion, dynamite, hydrogen peroxide, right? And we said those are powerful oxidizing agents that can cause a lot of harm. Well, that's exactly what our phagocytes are making. And again, on your um, page five, you guys, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a cartoon of the enzymes and the enzyme-catalyzed reactions um, in those phagolysosomes. And you can see there, your lysosomes are producing superoxide anions. They're producing hydrogen peroxide. They're even producing the equivalent of bleach, hypochlorite. That is crazy. Crazy, right? So that's that's the second punch to try to kill these invading microbes is the production of those toxic reactive oxygen intermediates. So I like to think of it as a boxer, and <coughs> the lysosomal hydrolytic enzymes are the first blow to the microbe, right? And if that doesn't knock them out, then we're going to make those reactive oxygen intermediates for the second blow, right? So if we don't kill them with the 
lysosomal enzymes, we're going to kill them with those reactive oxygen intermediates. So backup systems, really important in defenses. Okay, and then if our micro, excuse me, if our phagocyte hopefully is successful, the um, invading microbe is destroyed and digested, the nutrients are absorbed, we have waste material remaining, and so we could call this maybe a waste uh, vesicle or vacuole. That vesicle or vacuole will migrate to the cytoplasmic membrane and um, fuse to the cytoplasmic membrane and release the waste into the extracellular environment. This is the process we could call exocytosis. It's the opposite of endocytosis. Yeah. So, wow, your phagocytes are amazing, amazing. Okay, now I know you guys are so tired and overwhelmed, and so I'm, and so because of that, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> okay, so that you guys is the end of non-specific defenses. And obviously, we only hit a little bit, right? But I think I'd rather have us learn a couple of those non-specific defenses decently rather than try to go through all ten of them and you know just be specific. What we're going to do now, you guys, is just barely introduce the second R of our defenses. These are the specific acquired uh, or adaptive immune responses. They're called acquired because um, we develop these only after we've been exposed to a specific pathogen or a toxin, right? Um, they're uh, acquired because um, we're going to develop these after birth. They're specific because the defenses are usually specific for the pathogen that we encounter or for the specific toxin that we encounter. Okay? Now, these, as we mentioned earlier, these are what we would call the big guns. These defenses are very powerful. But it takes a while to get them activated. Um, the first time we're exposed to a pathogen, it might take 10 to 14 days before our specific acquired defenses get really working well. So we are relying on these innate defenses to save us you know, from dying from this invading microbe while these more powerful defense weapons are activated. Okay. Now, um, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on active acquired immunity, the immunity we acquire if we actually encounter the virulent pathogen in nature, or if we're vaccinated against a pathogen. Okay, this we're, we'll be covering both natural exposure and artificial exposure, which um, is vaccination. Okay. So, one of the first things we want to ask ourselves: What is it that triggers specific acquired? Uh, immunity. And the answer is antigens. Antigens are substances that trigger specific required immunity. Let's see, just turn this off. And if our system is working normally, antigens should be foreign, non self, not, not substances we make, right? Um, antigens, if our immune system is working properly, should be foreign um, elements to our body. Now, you don't have this picture, you guys, but um, you've got. <coughs> one that looks a little bit similar to this one. This is an actual example of a antigenic bacterial cell. Mm. Okay. And these antigenic bacterial cells, we can see um, our body, our immune system sees the components of the bacterium as being foreign, as being non-cell. So the bacterium is going to trigger a specific immune response. In this case, antibody production. And what this cartoon is showing us, you guys, is that different parts of the bacterium will trigger production of different types of antibodies. Makes sense, right? That we will have different kinds of antibodies that, for example, can attach to the protein flagellum of the bacterium. We have another type of antibody that binds to the, pro, uh, the protein pinky of the bacterium. So, we would say the bacterium acts as an antigen, but just, this is, this is vocabulary, you guys. The sites to which antibodies bind on an antigen are called epitopes or antigenic determinants. Now, let me tell you guys, I rarely use the term epitopes or antigenic determinants, but it's just a vocabulary word so that when you're talking with your <coughs> classmates or you have another immunology class, you know what is an epitope or antigenic? is the actual portion of the antigen.